welcome to episode 48 of the Brood Sages, Stormbound players with a head for the game. I am Freeloader, and with me, as always, are Sabaiku and Thomas. Sabaiku, how is it going tonight? Fantastic. Thomas, how's it going with you? Pretty all right. <laughs> We are the Brood Sages, easily the second best Stormbound related podcast in production. As a reminder, you can always follow us at Brood Sages on Twitter. Or for all of you who aren't going to take it anymore, our email address is thebroodsages at gmail.com. Uh, so, guys, uh, community news. Uh, as a reminder, Race to Heroes League. Sabaiku, what is this and, and when should people be paying attention? People should be paying attention now, now, now. Uh, Take part in January. This is just a little competition that MKM put together. The first people to make it to the Heroes League, as long as you can get there in the first week of the month, you get into a raffle, and there's extra raffle tickets for the first three people that make it. Um, So you get a chance at some extra rewards. Yes, I actually made it in the uh, raffle drawings into the last round, and then surprising nobody anywhere, I got eliminated by Stony J, who that's all he ever does is eliminate me. Uh, oh. Moving on, from, <laughs> moving on from there, Thomas. What about Toad Game? Uh, okay, I still honestly don't even know too much about Toad Game. I just don't have a chance of playing it. Shame. We, we need know. a bunch of nuns going behind Thomas, smacking him with a wooden <laughs> paddle. Shame. Shame. I know. I know. <laughs> Well, for those of you who don't know, Toad Game is a weekly tournament held uh, through the Stormbound Discord, so you have to be a member of the Discord to join. It's very quick and easy. There's a chance to win lots of coins just by playing. In fact, they give you a budget of coins. Uh, uh, You have to play at least three games. That budget of coins you get is 500. So uh, if you win a game, you get 100 from your opponent. If you lose a game, you give 100 to your opponent. So the worst thing that can happen to you is literally you can just join, play three games, lose all three, and walk away 200 coins the richer for having done nothing. As a freeloader, let me tell you how perfect this system is designed. (laughs) Um, but it's a lot of fun. No set rules. You and your opponent just kind of figure out when you're going to play and what rules you're going to play by. You want to play an all cats deck at level two, knock yourself out. Um, it's super fun. If you have any questions or if you want to learn more, you can always message ice coma. He'll be happy to help you out anytime you need it. Um, moving on from our community events, uh, we had a very interesting and and Sabaiku, I can never quite tell if these are impromptu. Like, is 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 Powell just deciding that today he's going to make Bajosa's anxiety level go through the roof, <laughs> or is this a scripted thing that they have? Like, you can never quite tell. You can never tell if it's planned or if Pavel's just had some drinks and is <laughs> messing with Bajosa. Uh, but yeah, he uh, and the reason why they were up late apparently is they had just finished watching a soccer match uh mm-hmm. and that that leads <laughs> me to believe that. The, that leads me to believe that pavel had some drinks and was having some fun uh, but he left <laughs> us with some interesting statistics on discord uh about the business side of stormbound which we don't really get to see so uh you know i thought it was a good idea for us to talk about that here in case anyone missed it well, well i know we've been curious before and we've talked about trying to uh unravel these so so getting some information specifically the the information on daily active users i think is is one of those things that um, really helps put everything else into light right um and so uh, for those of you who don't know what daily active users is it's a statistic that most video games have that um you know like stormbound or, or any game where you would queue into an online system uh, and daily active users just means over a 24 hour period, how many unique accounts on average log in. So Stormbound has, give or take, 10,000 to 12,000 daily active users. So it's a pretty good sized game. To give you an idea, that's that's bigger than Gwent, uh, as, as near as we could tell, looking into uh, 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 some online data, just doing some Googling. Uh, it's no surprise to anyone. A lot smaller than Hearthstone. Um, but it's still a very healthy sized game. Uh, and Thomas, it's growing, right? Absolutely. Um, not only from the data that they give us or that he uh, randomly drops to us, but even queue times. Uh, when I first started playing three years ago, a decent chunk of your games would end up being against bots. And now you're getting to queue more and more against people on a regular basis, which just pro, which is awesome. Not even queuing into people, but queuing into new people. Like I'm not seeing the mm. same name True. every time in the Heroes League, right? Like 
I'm running into new names. That's fantastic. It means there's new people coming in and growing their collection and playing. So uh, the for, for those of you who, who are numbers people out there, uh, Stormbound's averaging, give or take, about 800 new players a day. Uh, and uh, Powell says retention is above average for the market uh, for this genre of game. Um, which doesn't surprise me. Uh, every almost every uh, uh, Stormbound player I know is very hard headed and determined. <laughs> <laughs> we will not give up. Dang it! Uh, the game uh, peaks on the first of the month with about fourteen thousand daily active users on average on the first of the month, give or take. Um, and <laughs> I'm going to let you say this one, uh, Savaiku, because this note is. Uh, Thank, thank you, but I doubt this is real. <laughs> uh, Stormbound has a, quote, very good average session time, is what Pavel said. So, um, you know, when people play, apparently, they, they don't tend to just queue up for one game. They tend to play for relatively extended periods, and uh, probably entirely due to the length of Freeloader streams, is my guess. <laughs> So, so that's the background on the health of the game. The game is actually quite a bit bigger uh, than we thought. Uh, if you're doing the math in your head, uh, uh, daily active users, uh, that's over a 24-hour period. So you take you know, 10 to 12,000 divided by 24, and you, you can kind of figure out you're somewhere around, on average, four or 500 players a time at any moment, any, during any hour in the game. Um, so over the course of an hour, four or 500 people, this kind of gives you an idea of how draft mode hit the server so hard. Uh, uh, Powell said that draft mode surpassed Sheepyard's expectations, quote, by a lot, end quote. Uh, and we're not sure if this one got lost in translation or not, but it sounded like uh, he said that during the draft mode release, there were more than a thousand players, uh, more than uh, 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 on average. F and we think he means for that moment in time uh, from the previous day. So, so if you consider, uh, you know, the system that they have set up is there to handle, you know, four or five hundred, maybe peak of six, seven hundred uh, uh, active users at a moment. Uh, when you suddenly have an extra thousand over that, that, that would explain. <laughs> what we did uh on draft today uh which was a little painful uh, at times thomas no the 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 lag and the and the server instability it was pretty brutal yes <laughs> but in a good way right if you look at it in the moment it was frustrating and we all kind of wanted to tear our hair out but but uh this bodes well i think subaiku for for the mode uh that it generated this much excitement and anticipation no Absolutely. And you still see messages on the Discord from people saying, oh, I haven't played in a while, but I'm coming back into the game. Uh, I would like to think that the draft mode is a significant part of that. When you release something new and exciting, it's got to help to bring people in. Uh, I know for sure I played a lot more than usual the first few days of draft mode. Uh, and I suspect that uh, I was not the only one because I have never seen my friends list so active. Yeah, you had like over 30 friends uh, 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 online at the same time in a screenshot you posted. Um, side note, I don't have 30 friends in game. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, lastly, Powell also dropped a, a couple of very exciting um, leaks. Uh, spectate mode is uh, uh, far along in development. Uh, guilds campaigns uh, also far along into development. We did not get any specific dates uh, uh, in terms of target uh, launch times. Um, obviously, they they put a ton of time uh, and effort and focus into draft mode because it came out of nowhere, did it not? We, we received leaks about what was going to happen with it. And then the next thing you know, there's a patch note drop and it's out. Yeah, that was crazy. Just out of nowhere uh, in the middle of the month, right? I think it was the 20th was uh, the first day that it was available. So they didn't even wait for the reset on the first of the month. They just gave us a, an early Christmas present. I'll take it, man. Absolutely. That was a great way to spend a couple of days off. All right. Well, before we move into our uh, uh, discussion on the meta and the uh, patch note balance changes that are about to happen, um, I did want to plug in Brood Sages news, we have uh, episode 50 coming up. It won't be our next episode. That's 49, but the one after that. Uh, we are going to live stream it. That's going to be audio and video on Twitch and Discord, possibly even YouTube if we can figure out how to do that. Um, you will get our immediate reactions to the balance changes, new card reveals, if there are any, and answers to all of your questions that you put into chat. 
uh, you can plan on this being the patch notes episode of January. So whenever the patch notes get released by Sheepyard, it'll either be that day or maybe the next day or two after so that you know when to expect it. Um, we hope to see you there. We'd really like to have as many people as we can in chat. We recognize that the people in Europe, uh, this is a terrible, terrible time. <laughs> we normally do it right around 9, 9.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time in the U.S., uh, which makes it an absolutely ungodly hour uh, in Europe, and our apologies for that. Uh, but with that, let's move into the uh, patch notes, guys. So we, right before we move on, hint, yeah. hint, nudge, nudge to Sheepyard uh, for February balance changes uh, to be get some good uh, reactions out of us. <laughs> mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I, that's what, that's what they, you know, uh, uh, booming professors to two mana, you know, let's, let's go for some big <laughs> stuff that just like absolutely floors everyone. Oh, geez. <laughs> Heroic so soldiers are now free. <laughs> oh boy. All right. Moving on. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so speaking of patch notes, uh, we have the patch notes for the January 1st update. Uh, we have our standard balance changes. Uh, Thomas, uh, Lucky Charmers are getting a, a rework. What's going on? Just the um, base strength going up by one uh, across all the levels. Um, same ability, same strength on the ability. I see no change to the card. I, I think I want to play it more now in the Pirate Brawl, no? Yeah, uh, you're still one-shotting an opponent. Now you're just one-shotting <laughs> with extra. I was playing it in the level one Brawl earlier today, and... It's just, it comes out at 12 health if you have a full hand of pirates. Now it'll come out at 13 health if you have a full hand of pirates. Like that's, it's, it's still enough. <laughs> still doing the job. Still does the job. <laughs> All right. Well, Sabaiku, uh, what's going on with petrified fossils? Mana cost is decreasing from five to four, and the strength is going from four, five, six, eight, ten to four, five, six, seven, eight. So leveling like all these standard four mana cards. Um, mm. So this becomes basically another four mana tech card, uh, same as Siege Breakers or Melodious Sisters or Gold Grubbers. Um, and I got to say, uh, I don't really love this change for the card. I think it'll see some more play because it's cheaper and that always does incentivize people to use it. But Petrified Fossils, you know, it commands units forward that have equal or less strength to it. And that means you want it to be bigger because you want it to survive that trade by more in order to command more stuff forward. Now it just kind of doesn't do as much because it's not as strong. Well, yeah, but can't I keep my minion launchers at a low level so that I can command everything seven health or less forward? It's a lot of mana to do that. You could be using Harold's horn. <laughs> oh, goodness. Yeah, I, I don't know. I just... Petrified Fossils has always seemed to be too unwieldy. We, we, to your point, Sebeke, we need the, the strength high for it to have any effect on the board aside from you know maybe double box uh but at the same time then the only thing to do is to keep its mana cost up and when you do that it becomes an unplayable unwieldy card yeah it's in a tough spot for sure uh long time listeners might remember we talked about this probably gosh about a year ago um and my biggest problem with petrified fossils is really just that it's non-specific it commands everything forward uh, and that makes it a little tougher to use. If you have a board full of small tokens, you know, Forgotten Souls works in a limited geographic area of the board, so you have a little more precision about how you use it. You know, Harold Tim only targets one row. You have precision about how you use it. Forgotten Souls is kind of like, well, here goes everything, or maybe not petrified enough. Petrified Fossils, you mean? I mean? Sorry, Petrified Fossils is, yeah, here goes everything, or maybe nothing, you know, who knows? <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Um, yeah, like you, you definitely don't want to play it in a moonlit airy deck because suddenly everything is just too big. So you want to play it in like a really small token deck, but those are hard to build now, especially with, with, uh, a trekking alderman being so good. Hmm. I don't know. I, I think you, I think I agree with both of you guys. I, I, th I think this is an interesting change. Uh, maybe it just sees space in a, in, in a tech position, like to tech against toad spam, maybe. But hmm. possibly, but generally against them, you need to clear those units and you're going to run fluffy um, for that kind of Yeah, or game. trekking. Oh, yeah, right. or trekking. Um, All right. I mean, well, I'll let's... try it, but I don't <laughs> have much so faith in it. 
<laughs> I'll try it. Fine. Uh, all right, we'll move on from there then. Uh, uh, Thomas, talk to me about Dreadful Keepers. Dreadful Keepers' ability is uh, going up uh, by one across the board. So um, still ba- same base strength, but going up to three, four, five, or three, four, six, seven, eight for the ability. Um, just making a slightly larger token. And but not um, at levels one and two. Isn't that weird? Oh, yeah, I didn't even notice that. Well, the reason for that probably is that in equals, it's a pretty good card. Mm. Uh, three mana for three um, is perfectly fine. So when you have that potential chance of creating a token uh, on top of that already vanilla stat, um, pushes this card to be very good at equal levels. So I'm guessing that's the reason they never changed it. And especially with draft mode coming out now, people are playing a lot more equals. So I could actually see that was the, re- the reasoning for, for their change. Yeah, and considering it's an mm-hmm. epic, it's actually really hard to hit level three and up uh, with upgrades. You have to high roll your upgrade options. Mm-hmm. So three, four, I mean, you're, you're committing to something that's still going to be pretty meh uh, uh, until you, unless you can hit that third upgrade. <laughs> yep. All right, Sabaiku, Project Phoenix, what's going on? Project Phoenix gets a straight buff from six mana down to five. And the initial strength does take a hit instead of running from five to ten from levels one to five. Now it runs from four to eight. Hmm. So at level five, it initially has two less strength, but the ability does not change just the initial strength. So when it gets respawned, it will still get respawned with 10 strength. So it's an 8 strength, 1 movement unit that when it dies, becomes a 10 strength on your baseline. Correct. And will continue to respawn with 10 strength if, you know, you can keep it rolling. This feels really good. This this feels like it's going to see some play. This is absolutely like a, a nice mid-range value-oriented ironclad deck with... This or debug loggers in the five mana spot. Now they're both viable. That's what I was just about to compare it to was debug loggers because debug does see some uh, top level competitive play every mm-hmm. once in a while. And this is just another version of that, except this is almost more geared towards fighting off the air index that came to, to light after scrapped planners nerf. <laughs> oh, good point. Now the... Ooh. That's a really good point now. The downside here is that it is still a slow play, right? Like you're putting something out into the middle of the board. There's still counters with conversion or freeze. Um, it's it's not, uh, I, I think, not going to be that impactful to the meta, but at least now you'll see it. Correct. Imagine, yes. Imagine how bad it would have been if they actually made the spawn drop down to eight because then hysteria oh, can gosh. wipe it. This would have been such a bad nerf if that had been the case. If 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 the if the respawn was eight on your baseline, it's like the juiciest hysteria target ever. <laughs> oh, I'm glad they kept the spawn at ten. Absolutely agree. This feels good. I'm. You know what? I I have mine at level five. Uh, I might just go ahead and give this a shot next month. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, it's definitely something you could build around, but uh, I I worry that with people getting blizzard bombs up to a high level now yeah that it'll just be straight up countered too easily to be really relevant well if your opponent plays blizzard bombs and you play your phoenix into blizzard you're still good to go because blizzard's not going to freeze this thing an eight into an eight your phoenix is dead so it can't get frozen even though their ability goes off first uh there's nothing to freeze because phoenix is dead and then it's still going to respawn. Sure, but that's only with an even trade, right? Like if if I trade my Blizzard bombs into something else, you know, a gifted recruits or whatever first, just, and there's three strength left, then now all of a sudden your Phoenix is just kind of unplayable in that part of the board. True, but you can't. Yeah, um, if there's if you don't play anything around it, your opponent still can't even play Blizzard bombs into this. Hmm. Uh, at least, yeah. well, I, I guess it, it would be able to into the spawn. It'll invite some counterplay yes. for sure. Mm-hmm. But if your opponent gets the spawn off of it, they got 18 strength for five mana, which is perfectly acceptable. Yeah, definitely. Definitely nothing to sneeze at. No, no, no. And as a gentle reminder to all the players out there who don't uh, spend a lot of time playing Phoenix, I think I was going to say, I think it has to die off your baseline, does it not? It does, yes. Oh, okay, never mind. Okay, good. For a minute, I, I had this freak out that I'm confusing it with beds. But I think Broken Earth Drakes also needs to die not on your baseline. 
Correct. They both um, need to be in the middle of the board, not on either baseline. Right. Correct. So you you can't you don't really want to use Project Phoenix to clear a unit off your baseline. Uh, you you definitely want to play it in the middle of the board. You can only do it on your baseline if it's going to reset your opponent. Yeah. Because they'll okay, be able to move fair. forward generally. Okay. Uh, Thomas, let's move on from there with Wolf Cloaks. Ah, uh, yes. This is going to be fun. So, his, Wolf Cloaks' strength is going up by one across the board. Seven, mm -hmm. eight, mm -hmm. nine, eleven, and thirteen at the top end of the spectrum. And this is, I believe, also going to see plenty of play. Um, and even though it's like, what, one strength? Big deal. No, it, it'll see play because under current state, there's plenty of winter decks that are running Tigor. Um, because if you've got one or two units on the board, Wolf Cloaks gets that nerf. It's going to do like uh, nine damage to the opponent's base, which isn't too perfect Wolf Cloaks to clear your, uh, or to, to win the game. And Tigor couldn't either, but at, te at least Tigor gets the uh, buff. Now I think um, with the 13th strength at level five, even if you have got two or three other things on the board, just playing two Wolf Cloaks is still enough to win the game. And so I'm excited to try this out and hmm. not excited for my opponents to play it against me. <laughs> yep. It was already pretty good, and now it it's going to be really good. Mm -hmm. and, and if you like Wolf Cloaks, Sabaiku, how are you going to feel about Fleshmenders? Fleshmender strength is now going up also from, uh, it was four to eight. Now it is going up from five to nine. So just another plus one across the board. Uh, there's definitely a Winter's Runners deck that's going to work with uh, both of these in it. Frostcon's Runners is going to see a comeback, guys. I can feel it now. Oof. <laughs> you know, now you got a six-mana runner, a seven-mana runner. Both are real strong. And if you can get both of them into the base at full strength, that's just lethal. That's just one. Exactly right. That's just oh, lethal. Oh, nice. <laughs> I have to say, I've always liked Fleshmenders. I just wish it was a, just a little bit more offensive. Um and, and now it is yeah you know it's it's crazy um because that was really my one complaint with flesh menders is that you know this the body didn't quite do enough and giving it a little extra juice now for seven mana it's a nine strength runner like that's that's only that's one fun. off from salty outcast but you you get a huge buff out of it too mm -hmm. right exactly that's that's what makes it so dang good it's it's like the best, the best Tiger is the Tiger uh, when your opponent has nothing on board and you've got like two units and you know one of the two of them is just going to get a giant buff, right? And you, you don't want to see that dragon spawn. You want to see that buff. Absolutely. And, and Fleshmenders is like, all right, well, we'll just guarantee you the buff. For one Ooh. more mana, I can do that. <laughs> For one more mana and it has extra strength on the body now. Right, this exactly. is true. Yeah. So now it's going to deal more than Tiger. It's going to guarantee the buff. Ooh, baby. Now, the downside is that geographically you have to have something in the right position in order to allow Fleshmenders to run into the base or, mm -hmm. you know, to go where you want it to go, which, let's be fair, should be the base. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, it is. You know, but now, even if you can't get the buff for seven mana, just nine strength, it's okay. It's not good, but it's okay. It's it's acceptable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's I think that's the right way to look at it is it's. It's uh, you're probably not losing your front the following turn, which is the important part. For sure. Yeah, I think it's going to be fun to play. It may not uh, be um, like the most absolutely competitive card um, that exists in winter, but it's definitely enough to get it to start seeing some play as well. Oh, for sure. For sure. And there's not a ton of competition in the Santa seven mana spot anymore, right? Um, no, I think you're not right. in winter, really. It's not across the board. I mean, there's Salty Outcast, but I don't Which, think you'd ever choose Salty look, over this. I not anymore. I have played Winter decks with Salty Outcast, and mm -hmm. it worked fine. Uh, yeah, you know, I just needed something that was gonna uh, jam a lot of damage into the base. But I'd rather have Fleshmenders now. Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. Yep, I agree. All right. Well, uh, to summarize, um, there's definitely a, 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 a couple of cards that we're gonna see uh, uh, elevating levels of play. There's a couple of these Lucky Charmers, probably Petrified Fossils, maybe Dreadful Keepers that aren't going to see much change in their play rate, but maybe some experimentation early on to see if there's new application. Um, and then no new cards uh, uh, announced as of right now for January. Some of that might be because a ton of time was put in in December for the new draft mode. Guys, we just finished the second week of draft mode. For those of you who 
don't know. Uh, it's only available Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So that just finished up. What do we think? Uh, I'll start with uh, Thomas. Thomas, what do you think so far of draft mode? It has been literally the most fun time of playing Stormbound in the entire time I've been playing this game. <laughs> oh my goodness. And Sebeku? Yeah, hot dog. It is great. <laughs> Yeah, I'll, I'll 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 go right into that same camp. Um, it's everything I was hoping it would be. Um, the instability in the play mode has made me a little wary of streaming it yet, uh, just because I'm worried that it won't be the most uh, entertaining uh, uh, streams until you know that gets sorted out. Hopefully, it looks like it's getting better and better, especially when the Europeans go to sleep at night uh, after <laughs> after a certain time of day in in Europe. It seems to to get better. So I think. Um, I have hope that pretty soon it's going to be perfectly stable. But aside from that, my gosh, guys, uh, uh, Thomas, I have not been playing as long as you have, but I will say the same thing. This is the best thing to happen to Stormbound since I've been playing. For sure. It's just great that it's a new mode. It doesn't feel like equals. It doesn't feel like ranked. It's its own separate thing with its own strategy and its own uh, different meta. Yeah, and it's it's... As much as I enjoy equals, um, the problem I have with equals is no one seems to want to play equals against me when I have the time. Um, equals is something that you know we can we can play against each other, uh, but we have to organize it and we have to know someone else who wants to do it in the moment that we want to do it. Um, being able to queue into a pool of players already looking to play this mode makes draft mode much easier and more accessible. Um, I'm going to give a huge shout out. I, I think Sheepyard has made the reward system for this uh, wonderfully uh, 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 balanced, so much nicer. Like the, if I compare playing, let's say, Brawl for a couple of days to playing draft for a couple of days, holy smokes, am I coming out ahead with draft mode? Now, full disclosure, all three of us, I believe, are premium pass members. Uh, oh, so that is true. That does make a difference in the rewards that you get in draft mode. I have not, uh, I was not this month a uh, premium pass, but even for myself, it's still, still observed rewards. You spend yeah, the 600 it's... coins and you get the 600 back at the end of the draft. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm getting I'm getting more than that. Um, the rewards have been predominantly um, cards that I already have. So my exchange rate has, well, you know, the exchange rate isn't the most generous thing in the world. It's been more than adequate to um, more than, you know, more than make back my investment in uh, the draft mode every week. Yeah, and my calculations are just kind of ballpark. Uh, if you win two games with the pre with the premium pass, you break even. If you win three games without it, you break even. So even if you spend 600 coins on it, as long as you can go 50 50, you're doing all right. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. You're, yep. you're having fun and you're getting extra coins out of it. And, and, and it is fun. Like, like there is something really nutty about queuing into some of these decks and, and just you have a, you have no idea what they have originally, right? There's certain cards, you know, are going to be more prevalent in like, like lost psyches. You see a lot of lost psyches. You see a lot of, um, uh, gifted recruits, you know, obviously the guns, if you can find them, pick them. Um, Fluffy is a card you should be playing around. But then you see a lot of weird stuff. Like, Thomas, I'm seeing mechanical workers. Which is probably the best card in this mode. <laughs> it's like, how is that possible? <laughs> it's absurd. I've, there's so many of these little random things that I am now starting to be like, oh, so this is the reason why sheepyard balanced xyz random card that all every one of us looked at during this podcast and was like all right whatever yeah no one was playing it why do we care let's move on <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um well so so for those of you who maybe are new to draft mode uh and who haven't had the opportunity to play it yet or for those of you who are playing it and just can't seem to figure out how to build that great of a deck um, we are happy to announce, uh, we, we launched it last week, um, but this will be the first podcast that we mention it. We have for our listeners and anyone they feel like sharing it with, the honest to goodness BS guide to Stormbound Draft Mode. Um, and uh, uh, Sabaiku, what does this guide do? This guide has a ranking of every card in the game based on uh, which tier we think it falls into, tier zero being the most powerful, tier three being the least powerful. 
Uh, so we kind of sort things out so that when you're drafting, you have a resource that says, what should I pick? What should I invest my upgrades in? Which of these cards are going to make the most impact to my draft run? And and Thomas, we didn't just throw every card at you in one giant list. There is a list that's just the giant list that you can find. We also offer it uh, by faction. We offer it by rarity to kind of give people some ideas of, of you know, how different cards in a certain subset would compare. But to help you with your draft, we actually do something very special with it. What do we do? So um, as most people know, each pick uh, card throughout the draft has its own kind of set of criteria. The very first um, card selection being um, a, uh, a legendary card of a certain faction that will determine the rest of your um, draft picks, obviously. And so on the first tab, we've got um, the available uh, selections that you can have with the, the ranking of what um, tier they are of zero to, to three ranked in that order. And so then it's much easier for you to be able to see which card you should probably prioritize and then on the second tab, uh, the exact same thing. Once you've chosen your your faction, it's going to give you the ranking of which card uh, or set of cards would be the best for your deck based on those uh, those tiers again, so on and so forth over the course of your entire draft. So you can see over the course of your entire draft, you just keep going along with your tab and finding out what cards you should be prioritizing so that you can p- get the best possible deck um, to play with. Now, uh, Sabaiku, Thomas keeps talking about these tiers. Do we, we have definitions for tiers, right? Can you walk us through the, the four tiers that exist and what do they mean? Yeah, I said tier, tier zero is the strongest. That's the always choose this card if you see it, always upgrade it if it's presented to you for an upgrade. Uh, tier one, it's a very good card. You can build your deck around it. And it'll probably do better if you can upgrade it. Um, this is kind of the uh, you know the general utility cards. And then tier two, acceptable value for the mana, but don't expect to upgrade it. This is just a filler card essentially for you. This is the best of the bad options. Uh, and then tier three is the worst of the bad options. <laughs> Avoid drafting it if at all possible. Uh, and if you did have to draft it and you lose the game try to replace it as quickly as possible so to help our listeners understand thomas um the differences between tier zero and tier one right like i think we would all agree that in ranked mode and also in equals sparkling kitties is better than gifted recruits end of story there's no discussion but in this mode gifted recruits is ranked higher than sparkly kitties why Yep, that is an interesting uh, a question, and we had to um, determine how to to rank these cards, uh, and we've gone over it quite a few times to be able to come up with the current ranking that we have for them, uh, which disclaimer is always subject of change as we get new information and find new broken cards or new garbage cards over the course of the entire um, gameplay. Uh, But the reason why we've got Gifted Recruits higher than Sparkly is because of the amount of times and the amount of possibilities that you have to upgrade commons and uh, rares over the amount of times that you get to be able to upgrade epics. And so it's very likely that you're going to be able to upgrade your common, in this case, Gifted Recruits, to level 5 over the course of the draft. And generally, for epics, we see... uh, zero to two times that you can upgrade the card i think on on average it'd probably be around one time that you can upgrade any epic um just based on obviously personal experience so um, that's uh very widely ranging but if you're gonna be able to play a five strength gifted recruits or a three ish strength sparkly kitties go for the gifted recruits try and upgrade the gifted recruits Right. That's I, I think that's the thing that uh, we want to try to stress here is that in general, we are kind of sort of evaluating the cards based on at level five for a common or a rare, how busted is it in this mode? And that's where you get things like, oh, well, <laughs> execution is really hard to come by. Uh, equally hard to come by is Siege Breakers. So let me tell you how good Mechanical Workshop and Mechanical Workers are. <laughs> 
Um, uh, that's why you see those cards being ranked so high uh, versus epics that we all know are super strong. But in this mode, Saber Paws is only going to do, on average, two damage to your opponent in the final match when their base health could be as high as 15 or 16 or I think even 17, right? 17 yep. is the highest. Mm-hmm. So, so, so two mana for two damage against a 17 base health just isn't going to cut it. And so uh, some of these cards take a ding because of how rare it will be to upgrade them. And that's why we prioritize epics and legendaries that have really good value, even at level one. So something like Dawn Sparks, mm. level one or level five, it still generates four mana for you. It still does something powerful. Now, maybe the strength will fall off as uh, your uh, your cards and your opponent's cards get stronger but it's still going to do the job of letting you just do a little bit more with your hand than your opponent can do. Or a lot more with your hand. Dawn Sparks in this mode is busted. Um, One of the things that I think we've found to be true is because there's no set rule for what levels you should assume your opponent's cards are at like you know if you're in the heroes league assume everything's level five um here there's level disparities across the board and at every mana point on every turn something is bigger than it should be something is smaller than it should be so finding these little scrappy one one health remainders two health remainders for cards like toad for cards like dawn sparks uh even for cards like crowglyphs which can find a lot of value although it might not be a busted card in this mode um, because of the just disparities in levels everywhere, uh, finding these little scraps to generate value from Thomas is actually fairly doable. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And we're going to continue uh, getting feedback from people, uh, mainly in Discord, at which cards people think are incorrect, which cards they think that need to be changed. And we'll obviously test them for ourselves, and then we'll publish them uh, straight into the uh, the guide. Uh, for us, it was uh, mechanical workers. Again, because we're uh, at the high, high end of the leagues, nobody plays mechanical workers. But then there was one person in Discord that was like, hey, guys, play this. It is going to win you the game. (laughs) And so played it once and I was like, yeah, it'll win you the game. Let's uh... (laughs) easy to easy to upgrade uh, generates an insane amount of value and uh, the counters to it, which would be relatively prevalent in a ladder meta that could react to say everyone playing mech workshop uh the it's there's only one or two pulls that you get right there's only two one or two rounds that you have a chance to find a, a good actually it might be four uh, i can't remember if uh, siege breakers is a common or a rare rare okay so there's four rounds that you have in total to to try to high roll and find either execution or siege breakers otherwise you're on your own you have to try to figure out some way to play around the value and that's tough yep yep i will so, say Oh, just real quick, I want to thank Sheepyard um, for for making every draft uh, round we do after the first three free. It's allowed us to do a lot of testing that hasn't cost us all of our fortunes in gold. <laughs> yeah, and you know, this is the second week that we've had the draft, and to, uh, we've been constantly reevaluating the cards on the tier list and making changes. To me, it, it feels like totally different than when we started. It does. Um, so I kind of want to talk a little bit um, at how we kind of choose the, the tier system, mm-hmm. um, unless somebody else wants to jump in. I know Freeloader, you did a lot of work with the uh, initial ranking of them. And so um, just uh, put me in a place when I speak out of line. Uh, but in general, the way that we, we are kind of using a, a hybrid of um, just in general, how good the card is when you first pick it, um, and then, of course, how high level we think you're going to get it on average over the course of the draft. So that's where I was talking a little bit about how, how we're going to be able to get the commons and the rares much higher level on average mm-hmm. over the legendaries and the epics. Um, we didn't really take into account any um, synergy. And so, like, even though Mark to Dispray can be very good, it's sometimes too difficult to try and get other poison cards to work for it. And so we kind of had to, for the most part, take things in a vacuum when it comes to their gener- their on their own strength. Yeah, I mean, a perfect example of that, right, would be Giovanna. Giovanna is fantastic if you have, if, if we knew you had ice or some sort of, you know, I, I think icicle burst or some sort of freeze effect. 
Spellbinder Giovanna would very likely be a, a tier zero card or right on the cusp of being a tier zero card. But as it is, you have to pick it. The only chance you have at picking Spellbinder Giovanna is in round one of the draft. Uh, <laughs> you don't know what else you got in the deck yet. <laughs> so she falls off real good and, you know, really quick. She falls off in the utility as soon as you don't find a single freeze card. <laughs> And a nice example, a counter example there is Claxi, right? Claxi mm-hmm. is good. Claxi will always find value on the board if you happen to pick up something like Reign of Frogs or Azure Hatcher later on. Good for you. You high rolled your draft. Uh, whereas something like Bragda, you really need to have Reign of Frogs for Bragda to be useful because, you know, Bragda being a legendary, it's going to be hard for you to level it up. You're not going to see it presented too frequently. And that means that the other units are going to quickly outscale Bragda and you're not going to get a lot of value out of it. Now, exactly. the nice thing about Bragda is that the neutral legendaries are presented to you last. So you already know if you have Reign of Frogs and you already can say, oh, I, I am actually going to make good use out of Bragda. I rate it more highly than the Brood Sages do because, you know, we're just kind of looking at it in a vacuum. Yeah, mm-hmm. and look, e- even if you took Claxi in round one, it's very likely that Reign of Frogs in round two is not a tier two card like we have it currently rated. We have it rated as a tier two card in a vacuum. So we don't know what you chose as your first legendary. You might have chosen Temple of Time. And if you did, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> but but uh, we can't take for uh, for granted that you chose Claxi as your first legendary. So we don't think you're pairing it with anything at that point. We're just saying as a standalone two drop, it's horrible. <laughs> Yeah, so that's a really good point. We have no understanding of what you've already picked in a draft and what your curve looks like and what the cards you pick look like. So that really does impact your uh, your draft picks, right? Like we have a bunch of relatively high value, heavy hitting cards as tier one uh, because they're all kind of good, but you can't make your deck out of all of those, right? Then everything is six mana and above and you're going to lose every game you play. Mm-hmm. So so take our, our rankings with a grain of salt. It's going to definitely help be able to shape your average draft that you're doing. But when you've got Azure Hatcher in your deck and you've got Rain of Frogs in your deck and you run into your 12th pick and you've got Bragda as a possibility, absolutely grab it because you know what is in your deck. Um, but But as a general rule of thumb, this should be able to help you out significantly. Right. Our, our goal is to try to help you make a informed comparative decision. Like if you go to, uh, 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 you know, I don't know, let's pick pick one round f- four. Or, uh, let's go round three because it's smaller. Right. We'll go to round three and just take a look at the winter pack options. We are giving you all of the winter pack and neutral options blended together that are three mana or less because those are the only cards that can be shown to you. And we are telling you don't take a winter card. <laughs> For the love of God, stay away from me. <laughs> Turns out those cheap winter cards are not that great. They're terrible. <laughs> oh, this is the rares. Okay. Huh. Yeah. Didn't yeah, yep. just the rares. Just the rares. No, there's no good rares. No, they're no, they're, they're terrible. Aren't. Yeah, they are. <laughs> <laughs> um but that's that's basically what we're trying to give you is in in the vacuum of if you aren't sure which one of these cards feels right in the deck which one has the potential to be more powerful for you by the end of your run. That's all we're trying to show you is if, you, if you're not sure, here's where to go to find out. If you don't know which ones to upgrade, which ones might be better to upgrade, you know, in general, the easiest rule of thumb is try to upgrade the cards that you're sure you're going to be able to really upgrade. Uh, so you see that legendary once, and you're like, oh man, if I could get it to level four, imagine how great it'll be. Yeah, that, that might not happen. Uh, if you see Fluffy, upgrade it, and then upgrade it again the next time, and then the time after that, and then just win. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's that's the way to play draft. <laughs> Um, in all seriousness, we've put a ton of uh, time and effort into this. We are still trying to improve it. Um, we are taking uh, feedback from everywhere we can get, specifically Dormouser. Uh, huge shout out uh, to Dormouser for all the uh, uh, feedback uh, they've given us so far. And I hope uh, they continue to do so despite me putting my foot in my mouth and uh, making it sound like <laughs> he was being too too demanding. Not the case at all. Uh, we love feedback. Please feel free to... Uh, email us put you know twitter come into discord and uh tell us it sucks tell us how to make it better we want to hear all of that um i have a feeling that even by march our draft mode 
guide will still be BS, but it won't look anything like it looks right now. And with that, that's going to end the main portion of this episode, which means it's time for me to remind you to please contact us, like I just said, our channel in Stormbound Discord server, always, on Twitter at BroodSages, always, and you can email us at thebroodsages at gmail.com if you're a boomer like MKM. Uh, we also have an additional way for you to reach out and support us. We have a Gumroad account where you can become patrons of our work. You actually can find links to that in our BS guide to the Stormbound draft mode or on our Stormbound Kitty page. We've heard this week from Ubermensch who said, great episode. This was a mouthful of different topics. See you guys next year. Evil Deck said, thank you for the BS, the words I'm hearing. Thanks for all the joy you're bringing. Who could play it without, or who could play without it? I ask in all honesty. And the answer is, I don't know. I, I, I managed to play with uh, nonstop BS, so uh, I'm not the person to answer that. Uh, we also have been starting our, our meta matchups. We've done a couple of those now. Kep gave us a, a, a great stuff comment. Uh, back to that, Kep, thank you so much. Uh, we will continue in the new year to try to do our meta matchups as soon as we stop being distracted by all this draft mode stuff. Um, and normally at this point, we would just sign off. But with it being the end of 2021 and effectively the eve of 2022... I thought it appropriate to have a toast so that my fellow sages, let's raise our glasses to Stormbound. May it ever improve to our listeners. May they never realize how much better a podcast should be than us. And to the two of you, may we enjoy another fun year together in 2022. Happy New Year, everyone. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. And that's going to do it for this episode. For Sabaiku and Thomas, I am Freeloader. We are the Brood Sages reminding you to stay hydrated.